Hey guys, welcome back. So today we're out here to talk about Vietnam era M16s and variations thereof. When the United States got involved in the Vietnam War, we went to war with the M14. But by the time we got into the mid 60s, the United States was switching service rifles. And the rifle that we were going to looked very much like this one. This is a very early Colt SP1. You can tell it's an early model by the pinned rear sling swivel here. You can tell by its rubberized butt pad with no trap door in it, has a shorter length stock on it, has the original M16 style pistol grip, no forward assist, there are no serrations on the bolt carrier, it's slab sided, and uh, yeah, has the flat slip ring here for the triangular hand guards, and out front we have the signature three prong flash suppressor. So this would have been an example of a very early M16 that went into service with the U.S. military. But very quickly, the U.S. military wanted a smaller, lighter weapon based on the M16, but they called it a submachine gun even though it fired the 5.56. We're going to show you a couple of different replicas, I should say, of that rifle in this video. But first, let's start off by shooting the early example of the Colt SP-1 that I have here in my hands. Such beautiful rifles. This rifle is lightweight, air-cooled, and tipped the scales just a little over seven pounds, pretty close to eight pounds. But the U.S. military wanted something closer to five pounds. Let's take a look at what we now know as the XM-177 E2 rifle. Guys, I am not a historian, so I may get a few of the facts wrong. I'm not Ian from Forgotten Weapons, but I grew up admiring the XM-177 series of rifles, and I have a pretty good understanding of what's correct and what is not correct for these rifles. But I may get a few details wrong. With that being said, let's start off talking about the Troy rifle and then compare how it contrasts against the new Brownells rifle. Let's start off on the rear of the rifle. On the rear of the Troy, we have this two position collapsible stock, which is correct. Later stocks would be either four position or even six position, but the original rifles had two position stocks. This one has an aluminum butt stock on it. That is correct. It's aluminum with some sort of a black powder coat finish. Now, I don't know where they're getting these. I've found them or I've been looking for them online and they can cost as much as two to $300 on eBay when they pop up. They're hard to find. I don't know if Troy found them in a warehouse somewhere or if they're remanufacturing, but whatever they're doing, they nailed it. This is an exact replica, if not the real deal in terms of the aluminum stock. Moving forward on the Troy, we have what would normally be called a castle nut, but you'll notice there's a hole there and there's no castle on the castle nut. That's because this is a period correct locking nut. It has two holes, take a spanner wrench that you would use to tighten it down. The castle nut would come later in later M16 models and it is staked in place. Moving forward, we have what looks to be an original surplus M16, early M16 pistol grip. It's not dirty. That discoloration is part of the Bakelite type material, and that would be correct. Again, I don't know if they've reproduced it or if they found a warehouse full of these things in pristine condition, but that's a really accurate reproduction if it's not authentic. You'll also notice that the Troy rifle has a gray parkerized type finish. This would be the correct color and correct finish. From what I've read, Troy researched extensively the type of finish that was applied to the early rifles, and they've reproduced it for their series of reproduction guns. Now, with that being said, we have the teardrop forward assist, which is correct. We have a standard T handle for the charging handle. And right here, just in front of the rear takedown pin, we have a fake third pin. 
It's not a real pen. It's machined to look like one, and that's where the auto sear would be held if this were a true select fire weapon. The original military XM177E2s had safe semi-auto and fully automatic capability, so they would have that third pinhole. That's just a machine mark that looks like a third pinhole. It's not a machine gun. All right, moving forward again, we have the proper fencing around the magazine release. We have the correct trap door, serrated bolt carrier, everything looks good. We have the standard A1 or M16 rear sights, which have the flip over aperture sight and that is windage adjustable with the markings and the aluminum for you know telling you if you're moving the, the rear aperture left or right, the point of impact, which is all correct. You'll notice there's no markings inside of here or anywhere on the right hand side of the rifle. On top of the carrying handle, we do have the hole drilled, so you would be able to put optics on it if you chose to. Moving forward, we have a tapered slip ring, which I believe is correct for the XM177E2. And we would say that see this tapered slip ring on later models of the M16. Moving forward yet again, we have the hand guards. Now the hand guards on the Troy, I'm gonna give them a D for this. These just don't look right. You can see a gap right here. If I push, they pop. They don't fit together properly. That gap is on both sides of the hand guards. They do have the metal heat shielding on the inside, but I'm gonna say that this is probably the worst part of the gun. It's ugly, it's unsightly, and I just don't like it. Um, yeah, so I will probably wind up replacing the hand guards on this particular rifle. You will notice on the front here, this painted eagle, that is a correct marking. Although I believe that marking would be over on the magazine well. Uh, Troy did put that painted marking right here on the front of the magazine well. Up here we have a rubber coated front sling swivel. We have a standard M16 front sight block. You'll notice that it does not have a bayonet lug. Keep in mind the purpose of this rifle was to be lightweight. With this moderator on the end of the barrel, it couldn't accept a bayonet, so you might as well machine the bayonet lug off and save some weight. And that's what the correct uh, XM177E2 would have. No bayonet lug. Has a standard M16 front post that's marked, so you know if you're going up or down. It's made to be adjusted by tool or by the tip of a bullet, and it's a tapered post, which is correct. Now, both these rifles have about 12 and a half inch barrels. Uh, the original Commando would have a 10 inch barrel. The XM177E2 would have an 11 and a half inch barrel, and then it would have this moderator on the end. And then we have the grenade ring right here. And we'll talk more about the grenade ring and the moderator here in a minute. So overall, this rifle is a very close replica of the XM177E2 with only a few minor dings. Let's move over to the other side of the rifle. You'll notice that it has safe semi and auto markings but it cannot go to the auto position. But it looks good, it's looking the part, just like the fake third pinhole. Really like that feature. Standard ping pong paddle. And then over here, you're gonna notice the lack of any type of, of manufacturer marking, but it does say property of US government, XM177, uh, E2, and then it has a caliber and a serial number. And Troy has discreetly put their manufacturer markings on the inside of the trigger guard. Now on my earlier GAU-5, it had the Troy logo here, and they've since done away with that and moved their markings here, and I much prefer the way this looks over my GAU-5. So yeah, eh, too bad on that one. I already marked, I already noticed, or, or pointed out, I'm sorry, the paint here on the front. So very, very authentic reproduction. Overall, minus the rather poorly made hand guards uh, for the front end here, I would say that this rifle is a pretty close to being an A for reproduction. It looks really, really good, looks the part. Very few things I can find wrong with it. I just hate those hand guards. All right, here we have the Brown Ells rifle. Let's start off on the rear. We have a two position buttstock, which is correct. This is made out of polymer. That is not correct. This is a modern buttstock. It's lighter, so it does make the gun a little bit lighter, but it's not correct. Moving forward, we have a standard castle nut. That's right out of a modern parts bin. And uh, yeah, that's what a modern castle nut looks like. That is not period correct. It's also not staked into place. 
moving forward, we have a teardrop forward assist, and we do not have the fake pinhole. Some of you may care about that, some of you may not. But you'll notice the finish on this gun is much darker. It's black as compared to the gray finish of the Troy rifle. And that's because this is a standard uh, anodization process, a modern process, and would not be period correct for the XM177 E2. Uh, this is probably just one of those things. I'm gonna have to uh, maybe send it in for warranty repair. I just noticed it, or I'll probably just replace it myself. It does have a teardrop forward assist, but we noticed that there's a crack. It looks like this is probably a cast part. I can see the spring inside there, and it's broken. So I'm gonna have to replace that. I may send it to Brownells, or I may just pick one up uh, offline. They're, they're very affordable, and I can swap that out myself. But it is cracked and broken. I thought that I'd point that out. The pistol grip is a modern reproduction. It's just a standard injection molded polymer. It's not nearly as hard, doesn't have the same feel as the one on the Troy, but it definitely looks the part. Up here on the top of the carrying handle, the army handle, we have NDS, which stands for Nodak Spud. So now we know where Troy, or I'm not Troy, where we, uh, we know where Brownells is sourcing the receivers, at least the upper, that's Nodak Spud and they're a popular manufacturer of retro parts. They've done a number of retro builds in the past of various different types of ARs. So it only makes sense that Brownells would work with them to have them manufacture these receivers. We have standard M16 style sight, which is correct for the gun. We have the flipping aperture, which is correct. Hole drilled for optics, everything looks good. Moving forward, we have a standard early M16 slip ring. I do not believe this is correct for the XM177E2. It should be tapered like on the Troy rifle. I did, I think I pointed out the fact it has the fencing and the push pins that are retained, which is all correct. The hand guards on the Brownells rifle are much nicer. As a matter of fact, I hopefully can find these on the Brownells website. I may wind up ordering a set of these to put on my Troy rifle because these fit nice and snug. They don't pop, they don't move around. They look good, there's no gap between them. It's a much better looking handguard. They do have the metal heat shielding on the inside. Moving forward, we do have a rubber coating over the sling swivel, but we have a bayonet lug, and that is not correct for the XM177E2. That should be machined off. Again, both rifles have about a 12 and a half inch barrel, and then the sound moderator. Looks like they may have sourced these from the exact same spot because the two sound moderators look nearly identical. However, I will point out on the bottom of the Brownells moderator, there's a big, ugly weld. That's where they pinned and welded it to make it legal, but if you take a look at the Troy, you can look all the way around the moderator and you cannot find where they pinned and welded it. So they covered up that on the Troy very effectively. So those are the two rifles, $1199 and $1299. The Troy is $100 less expensive. Let's talk about what comes in the box. This is the Troy box. Very nondescript, not very fancy on the outside. And on the inside, uh, this is just some legal paperwork, the FFL and stuff from when I ordered the rifle. I will say that I placed an order for this rifle and it took me almost three months to get it. I kept emailing them asking what the status was and I kept getting responses two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. You're just gonna have to be patient if you order one. I don't think they keep them in stock, they build them to order, and it can take several months before you get your Troy rifle, just know that. I almost canceled my order because I didn't think it was coming. But inside the box, you're gonna find all sorts of cool stuff with the Troy rifle. You're gonna get a Troy 20 round magazine. It does say Troy on the bottom, but it's phosphated. It looks just like an original Colt magazine. You're gonna have a standard M16 cleaning kit, which has the nylon toothbrush in it, pipe cleaning, cleaning rods, uh, pipe cleaners and cleaning rods disassembled, and the uh, Alice pack or the Alice gear connectors, which is all correct. Comes with a little tiny owner's manual that shows you how to use the rifle, and it's for the GAU 5 and the XM177 E2. Thought that was going to blow away. It comes with what would be an improvised sling in the field, and this is very similar to what. Special Operations guys, MACV, SOG, and other operations groups would have uh, fashioned out of stuff they had on hand. Troy sends you one with both the GAU-5 and the XM177E2, so this definitely looks the part if you choose to put it on your rifle. You also get a 30-round magazine. This is what the 20-rounder came in. I already took it out. So you get a 30-round magazine as well, so you get a 20 and a 30. 
then you get a reprint of the original instruction manual that came with the M16A1. And you can find pictures of these on the internet, but this is printed on very high quality stock. It's all color, it's kind of cartoonish, but it's an exact reproduction of the manual that was given to the soldiers in the field. Really kind of cool. Neat piece of history, if nothing else, and very nicely done. And again, on very, it's printed on very good stock. Then you get what looks like an official document which says submachine gun 556 XM177E2. Yes, they did classify the Colt Commandos and the XM177 series of rifles as submachine guns, even though they didn't shoot pistol calibers. They shot the 556 round. So they did call them submachine guns. This looks like an official military document talking about how to maintenance the weapon. So this would be specific to the actual XM177E2 rifle. And this would have been a reproduction of what would have been shipped with a standard M16 or M16A1 to the troops. And then you get a thank you letter. So a part of the proceeds of every Troy rifle actually gets donated to special operations charities and they send you a thank you note uh, for that. So I believe it's 50 bucks or so from every sale goes to support those special operations charities. And then you get some Troy swag. All right, that's everything you get in the box with the Troy rifle for $11.99. The Brownells rifle comes in a very cool looking retro box on the inside. It's just a couple pieces of foam with the rifle inside. And in that, you will find a 20 round Brownells magazine an envelope with another reprint of the M16A1 user's manual that would have been given to the soldiers for the M16A1, not necessarily for the XM177E2. So, and again, it's on the similar stock as the Troy, very nicely made and nicely done. So that's what you get with the Brownells gun. And all of this is what you get with the Troy gun. Brownells is offering an entire line of retro series rifles. They soon should release the AR-10, which I'm really excited to get my hands on. Now, I've already done a video on the 601 Air Force rifle, and this is the next rifle in that lineage of retro rifles that they're bringing to market. So I'm gonna go ahead and shoot the rifle for the very first time this afternoon. I'm gonna go ahead and extend the stock to the firing position. I have a 20 round magazine. This one's an actual, uh, Troy magazine, so this is the one that came with the Troy rifle, but it looks just like the original Colt aluminum magazines. I have 55 grain freedom munitions, ball ammunition loaded into this magazine. I'm going to go ahead and char charge the rifle, make it ready. Now, I will say that these rifles feel super lightweight. They almost feel like toys. Standard T-handle charging system, chambers around, and now I'm going to take a few shots at that challenge target downrange and see if this rifle is zeroed out of the box. Yep, at least at about 40 yards she's zeroed. I was beating steel with this thing pretty good. So rifle has 100% function, feels really good in the shoulder, and it's definitely lightweight. Let's grab that Troy rifle and put the first 20 rounds through it and see how it functions. This is the Troy version of the XM177E2. Now you'll notice that this one is a much light, lighter color. It's a gray color versus the black color of the Brownells rifle. It also has that speckled grip, and you're probably thinking, I got it muddy or something, but that's not the case. That's just a Bakelite grip, and that's a very early style M16 pistol grip. It's probably actual military surplus, which is kind of cool. I'm gonna stick the 20 round magazine into the rifle and extend the stock to the shooting position. <clears throat> Load that first round, and now let's see if the Troy <clears throat> is zeroed at about 40 yards.
think it's just a little bit right, but 29 of the 30 rounds landed on target. I saw it go just off the right edge, so I aimed a little bit to the left and connected, so I may need to do some uh, windage adjustment to the Troy rifle. Lightweight, feels good, shoots good, and it functions 100%. I'll try to be brief here, guys. If you would like to support us at the Military Arms Channel, the best possible way to do that is to swing by and become a Patreon supporter. YouTube hates us. They hate gun content. They hate conservative speech. They hate, um, I don't know, they probably hate themselves. But they're constantly taking away our money through demonetization, and they're always threatening to kick us off their platform. We're getting ready to go through uh, a new policy change. So if you'd like to support us, please consider going by patreon.com forward slash military arms. There is a link down below and becoming a Patreon supporter. We also give away free ammunition. Thanks to our friends over at Freedom Munitions. We give away free t-shirts every month. Thanks to our friends over at forgefromfreedom.com, which you can also swing buy and if you're a patron subscriber you can get a discount on Forge from Freedom shirts. We have all sorts of cool shirts over there that are the map collection. So please consider swinging by supporting us at Patreon and also guys support other gun channels that you find over on patreon.com because they're all suffering the same fate with YouTube cracking down on us monetarily and through new policies. And also guys really quick swing by and check out full30.com everybody that's being displaced and being harassed over on youtube in the gun tube sphere is moving over to full30.com that's our lifeboat swing by full30.com check it out it's where freedom rings you're going to find most of your top firearm content creators already over there waiting for you guys the sound moderator it was used on the 177 e1 e2 and the colt commando all variations of it now what was it used for well there are three things that it's said to have done one of them I know to be true, the other two I don't know. I've just read multiple different stories. So what I do know that it does is suppress the flash. The original Colt Commando had a 10 inch barrel and 5.56 is capable, capable of producing horrendous fireballs even in broad daylight with that short of a barrel. The moderator drastically reduced the muzzle flash. So that much I know it did and did quite effectively. Now if you take a look at a cutaway design, which you can find online, You'll, you'll see that there are chambers, like expansion chambers, that were built into the original device. Now, these are replicas, and these are just hollow tubes. But those expansion chambers were said to do two different things. I've read two different stories of what they did, or what they accomplished. Now, keep in mind, the Colt Commando, the original, had a 10-inch barrel. By the time we got to the XM177E2, we had an 11.5-inch barrel, both very short. But with the 10-inch barrel, your gas port is about an inch from the end of the muzzle. That means the bullet leaves the barrel and gas pressures can drop off prematurely. So the moderator helped to keep those gas pressures high enough to keep the gun cycling reliably. So that's one reported purpose of the moderator, aside from flash suppression. It's also been said that it looks like a miniature suppressor. It has what looks like little expansion chambers on the inside of the originals. And it's said to moderate the sound, to bring that sound signature down a couple of decibels. With the shorter barrel, you're gonna have a much louder crack, and enemy forces would presumably be able to tell the special forces guys with their shortened barreled rifles uh, from just standard regular army troops with their 20 inch barreled rifles. So it's said that the moderator moderated the sound as well, bringing that sound signature down a couple of decibels so the enemy combatants wouldn't know that it was special operations guys firing their XM-177s at them. Is that true or not? I don't know, but if you look on the inside of this thing, it definitely looks like a miniature suppressor. Not this one, this one's legal ATF in case you're watching. This is just a replica. Now there was a downside to this. These were known to cause accuracy issues. As these were used, carbon would build up in them and particulate from the jackets or the bullets would build up in them and cause accuracy issues. The guns would become inaccurate or inaccurate the more you use them. So it was a definite downside to the use of the device. Also, the grenade ring. Obviously a standard NATO rifle grenade is not gonna fit over this moderator, it's too big. So what's it there for? Why do we call it a grenade ring? Well, that's because there was a prototype of the M203 out there called the XM148. And it was a grenade launcher. You take off the bottom handguard, it mounts the receiver here, and it clamped to this grenade ring. Just like a modern M4 carbine has a step in the barrel. That step in the barrel is for a modern M203 to attach to the barrel. This served the same function back in the 60s with the prototype XM148 40 millimeter grenade launcher. Little did the special operations guys back in the 1960s and 70s know that their XM177s would evolve into our standard issue M4 infantry rifle. 
and that's what happened, guys. This is the ultimate evolution of the original Colt Commandos, the 177 E1s and E2s. It's now our standard infantry rifle with a few, a few more tweaks and modifications, right down to the M203 grenade launching ring on the end of the barrel. Yep, she's a beauty. This is one of the FN Collector Series. Wonderful rifle, guys. And yeah, the sibling to the original Colt Commandos. I know what you guys are gonna ask. Does it take Glock magazines? No, it takes AR-15 M16 magazines. And how well does it 80s hip fire? Well, let's find out. Oh yeah, and a bump fires without a stock too. I forgot to mention that part. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed coming out to the range with us this afternoon, taking a look at these two interesting products, one from Brownells and one from Troy Industries, both pretty faithful copies of XM-177 E2 Colt Commando rifles that were in use during the Vietnam War and after. The U.S. Air Force still uses the GAU-5, I believe, and uh, you may still find some of these old XM-177 E2 sitting around somewhere in inventory someplace. Very cool pieces of history. Guys, if you'd like to support the channel, another way you can do that is to swing by and check us out at coppercustom.com. That's where we have our online store. You can pick up a Mac patch. You can get a free one-year GOA membership by just picking up a Mac patch or buying something from us and just adding one-year free GOA membership to the cart. Adds nothing to your total. And when you check out, you get that one-year free membership. Thanks for watching, guys. Thanks for all those years of support. We'll talk to you guys soon.